I am Reverend Marcus Gaston X of UFCC Philadelphia, and I am excited to be here on this night, this fifth night of Holy Week. Um, and I'm immensely proud to stand with my with my with my fellow divine warriors. Um, in the room. I'm excited about this whole thing. I want to say thank you to our host, uh, UFC NYC, for their second year of Holy Week. Um, it is truly, truly an experience, and we have been blessed on this occasion. So why are we here today? Why are we here today? What is the event that we're celebrating on this day? It is Holy Thursday. It is Maundy Thursday. We're observing the Last Supper. And how can we elevate that to the theme of next level for this year? How do we do that? I'm gonna tell you. So if I was gonna title this message anything on today, it would be beef, it's what's for dinner. I don't know if y'all remember the reference from back in the day um, where beef was all the craze. It was beef, it's what's for dinner. And I know they had lamb on that, on that Passover evening, but if you hold and rock with me for a little while, you understand where I'm coming from with beef being what's for dinner. So when I considered this theme and I, and I thought about it and, and, and thought about the Passover meal and what they might be eating, I thought about beef because I might've been a little bit hungry, but beef has come to, to, to settle into my spirit to mean to be elevated. We're talking about left ne next level here, aren't we? Next level, holy week, be elevated enough to follow. And I sat with that this week and I sat with it and I was like, well, what does that mean? Because we talk about all the time that, you know, we wanna elevate, we wanna go to the next level and we wanna go higher and higher and higher and higher. And the word that comes to mind in that process is not follow. But there's quite a few things that happened on this day in which Jesus gave us an example on how to be elevated enough to follow. So we're going to walk through this reference and, 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 and see what we're looking at. What are we following? What are we following? What examples did Jesus give us on this day? I want to look at three different things tonight. I want to look at humble service, the new commandment, and next level communion. All right, so I'm gonna jump right in and I'm coming from the book of John and it's chapter 13 and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. And I'm gonna read verses one through 17 for you to set the scene on what's happening here uh, because it's interesting what John decides to record here. And so this section of scripture is entitled Jesus Washes Feet. And it says, Jesus knew that night before Passover would be his last night on earth before leaving the world to return to the Father's side. All throughout his time with his disciples, Jesus had demonstrated a deep and tender love for them. And now he longed to show them the full measure of his love. Before, they, before their evening meal had begun, the accuser had already deeply embedded betrayal into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now Jesus was full aware that the father had placed all things under his control for he had come from God and was about to go back to be with him. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer robe and took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. Then he poured into a basin and began to wash the disciples dirty feet and dry them with the towel. But when Jesus got to Simon Peter, he objected and said, I can't let you wash my dirty feet. You are my Lord. He said, you can't do that. Jesus replied, you don't understand yet the meaning of what I'm doing, but soon it will be clear to you. Peter looked at Jesus and said, you'll never wash my dirty feet, never. I think Peter had some foot issues here. He was like, mm-mm, we've been outside. We've been walking and kicking up dust and dirt and my toes is a little funky and I might got a little bit of a bunion. You can't touch my feet, Lord. That's not your place. Jesus goes on to say, he says, but Peter, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, then you will not be able to share life with me. So Peter said, Lord, in that case, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head too. Jesus said to him, you are already clean. You've been washed completely and you just need your feet to be clean. But that can't be said of all of you. 
for Jesus knew which one was about to betray him. And that's why he told them that not all of them were clean. I'm down at verse 12 and it says, after, their, after washing their feet, he put his robe on and returned to his place at the table. He said, do you understand what I just did? You've called me your teacher and Lord and you're right for that's who I am. So if I'm your teacher and Lord and have washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example that I set for you and wash one another's dirty feet. Now do for each other what I have just done for you. I speak to you timeless truth. A servant is not superior to his master and an apostle is never greater than the one who sent him. So now put into practice what I have done for you and you will experience light and life of happiness enriched with untold blessings. And it's interesting that this is the only gospel that records the foot washing process that Jesus had did. And uh, as, I was, as I was preparing for this message, I, I set in uh, with a, a song to meditate on and it's, it's, it's by our very own, the movement's own Reverend Cheryl Bragg in her song, um, We Serve a God Who Served Us First. And if you get a chance, look it up. It's on uh, YouTube, um, I believe, or YouTube Music. Um, it blessed my spirit to sit in that song over the past day or so. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, washing feet. We don't have all the modern uh, amenities these days to, you know, kind of keep our feet together. You know, they, they, it wasn't no socks or nothing like that. It was just dust and sandals. And so Jesus stopped the meal. Before we got started, Jesus stopped the meal and started washing the feet of his followers. The first thing that we want to look at on this Thursday, the humble service. Washing feet was reserved for the lowest of the low servants. And so here we are with Jesus and all his people in the upper room, the leader, the master, the teacher, stopping to perform a servant's duty. And then turns around and says, follow the example that I'm giving to you. I thought about it and I was like, well, what does this, this feet represent? Feet can symbolize a lot of different things. And, and, and to me, what settled in is that feet represents our life. And so washing the feet is not only an example of, of humble service, but it's also a symbolic gesture of preparing your life to follow in the footsteps of the teachings of Christ. We have to be mindful and make sure that our feet are in one accord on where it is that we're trying to go to. So sometimes we have to be accountable to each other. Let me wash your feet, fam. Let me make sure your feet are on this right path of Christness operating in the anointing because we know that Christ is a title. It wasn't Jesus' last name, it's a title. It meant the anointing one, no anointed one. We too can be a Christ because we have our own anointings that we are supposed to go out into the world and share with people. And so the washing of the feet symbolized that sometimes we have to get ourselves together and prepare ourselves to go forth and do this work. Another thing that came to mind when I was looking at this, this humble service this life of servitude was being of service to all. And Jesus showed us what that might look like. You know, it's kind of cute to think that, you know, I'm just going to, you know, wash the feet of, you know, my fellow UFCM folks because I like y'all. I know y'all take care of y'all feet too. So the work ain't that hard. That's cute. It's cute. And we do that well. But have we challenged ourselves to be in service to all people, all people everywhere. We're gonna be in, uh, called to service to a lot of places that may be uncomfortable. We have to be willing to get our hands dirty to help liberate our friends, our family, people that we don't even know, strangers. 
we're going to encounter a lot of people who may not understand exactly what it is that we're doing. They're like, why, why are you doing that? I, I don't get what you're doing. That don't make no sense. Why? I, I, I just don't understand. Even Jesus' disciples, they didn't always understand. If you read through the scriptures, they always like, Jesus, what that mean? I, I, don't, I don't quite get it. And Jesus is patient with them. Jesus says, you know what? You'll get it. You'll understand a little better by and by, right? But we're also gonna come across people, maybe like Peter, who says, I'm not worthy of this. I'm not worthy of where you're trying to take me. I'm not worthy of what you're trying to do for me. I'm not worthy of what it is you're trying to liberate me from. We're gonna come across people like that. It's our job to be like, no, you are more than worthy. Our good news, our gospel says that God is love and love is for everyone. That includes you, the ones who don't think that they're worthy for this. That is part of who we are in service to. And true enough, we are in service to people who may wish us harm. Judas got his feet washed too. Jesus called him out, not specifically, but he was like, I know everybody ain't clean here, but I still wash your feet because I am in service to all people. That's one of the first things that I want us to really consider as we look at this, this, this day, this Holy Thursday, this Maundy Thursday, is that we are to be in humble service to all people. And right there, I was about tired because I was like, well, I know me in my humanness. I don't walk around with my Christ on all the time, and that's real. I don't walk around in my anointing all the time. That's real. We are human. We are much like Jesus. We are divine. We are divine creations. And we are also having a human experience. So that's okay. So I know I have to elevate myself. I need to level up. I need to take myself to the next level. I need to be like, where is the beef? Where is the beef? Am I being elevated enough to follow? Or am I trying to strike out on my own and do my own thing because I think I know in my humanness what is always right? Where is the beef? Beef, it's what's for dinner. That's what we're having tonight. So I said, okay, all right, humble service. I know for me, I got some work to do. That's okay, especially that little part for people that I know mean me harm. Not people that are like hiding in the bushes, like, oh, I'm gonna get them. Like people that are boldly in your face to mean you harm. I am still in service to you. I had a friend that uh, showed me an example of what that looked like. Y'all know uh, uh, Chick-fil-A and you know all of their you know, anti-LGBT, all of this kind of stuff. So there was a demonstration in, 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 in my town, uh, outside of a Chick-fil-A, a lot of uh, conservatives out there, you know, with their signs, you've seen them before. And my friend, she, she, she identifies as a lesbian. And so she went out there knowing that these people meant her harm, specifically her, meant her harm. And she took them water to drink. It was a hot day, it was in South Carolina, so it was hot in the midst of summer. And so to offer water to these people who mean you harm, who don't agree with who you are as a person, that's an idea of what it may look like to offer up service to all people, no matter who they are, what they doing, that's what it can look like. And it takes a big person to do that. So I sat there in it and I had to sit in it for a little minute. And I thought about the second thought that I wanted us to look at and investigate. Because after the feet washing happened, Jesus went on and he was, he was speaking with people and, and he was holding conversations with everybody that was in that upper room at the table. And he gave a new commandment. And this is down at verse 34 and 35, if you wanna go back and, 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 and check the biblical receipts, cause it's there. It's written in red, so you know Jesus said it. That's what they say. And so he says, so I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. 
For when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. And I was like, okay, of all the things that could have been on Jesus's mind at the Last Supper, at the dinner table, in the upper room, knowing that somebody's trying to set him up and betray him, knowing that he is probably going to die in the next few days, and not a, a, a quick, painless death, a slow, agonizing death, all of these things in his mind. And he chooses to give a simple new commandment, love. Love each other as I have loved you. Because they had been with him for a good minute. They done traveled everywhere. They've been up the mountains, down the mountains, across the seas, in the desert, in the woods. They've been everywhere with him, listening to him, learning from him. And of all the things that he taught along the way, he left them one command. Love people like I showed you how to love. Hmm. Hmm. It's so simple, but it's so huge to love people with the type of love that Jesus had for people, for everyone. Didn't matter. He was talking to all kinds of folks he wasn't supposed to be talking to. Tax collectors, uh, you know, folks that was just robbing and stealing and doing all kinds of stuff. All the people that all of the uh, uh, churchy folks all these wrapped in religiosities, the Pharisees and all those, you ain't supposed to be talking to them. They're not worthy of the good teaching. Plus they don't bring no coins to the storehouse. That's what the Pharisees were saying. But Jesus said, uh -uh, I'm setting all of that aside and I'm gonna love everybody. I'm going to liberate everybody. I'm teaching everybody. I'm trying to reach everybody. It don't matter who you are, what you did, what you didn't do, where you're from, who your mama is, who your daddy is, I love you. And that is the commandment that Jesus gave to us on his last night with us. Simple. I love that part that it says, for when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. A few nights ago, uh, Deacon Quincy, I believe it was, spoke about fruit. He charged us, he said, will the real UFCM stand up? And I was like, oh, really? You gonna call us out like that? But he talked about the fruit and he talked about the tree and it may have leaves, but if it don't have no fruit, what is it really doing? We are supposed to be bearing fruit. How will other people know that we are the vine of Christ if we are not bearing that fruit of love. We just out here, if there's no fruit on our tree, they don't know that we are UFCM, that we are uh, led and understand that God is love and love is for everyone. They don't know if they don't see the fruit. And so the new commandment should resonate deep in our heart. We should post that up. I'm a fan of putting sticky notes all over the place to remind myself of things. Am I operating? Am I honoring? Am I going forth with the new commandment to love people the way that Jesus loved people? Am I taking that message of love out into the streets beyond my comfort zone, beyond my bubble, beyond the people that just like me, beyond the people that know me, beyond the people that love me? You don't have to love me, but I love you. I don't remember which church it is in the moon. I was like, I love you and there's nothing, nothing you can do about it. I, can't, I don't recall offhand who says that, but it's beautiful. You don't have to love me, but I love you because Christ taught us how to love one another and how to be of service to one another. Where's the beef? Beef is what we're serving up for dinner tonight. Being elevated enough to follow these examples that Jesus has given us. If y'all know me by now, I was like, oh, I didn't got too many assignments now. It feels like a lot of work, but it's not. It's one of those things that we practice daily. 
We have to practice it every single day. We don't come out knowing how to be uh, perfect all the time in, in our lovings. We make missteps. Sometimes I may love you in not your love language. There's different ways that people understand and receive love. So they are languages that we have to learn and understand and be like, okay, okay. You don't understand this way that I'm trying to love you. I still love you, but let me try to love you in a language that you understand so that you can go forth and love other people and also be able to love people in a way that they can understand. Hmm. Hmm. Where is the beef? Are we being elevated enough? Are we taking ourselves to the next level enough to be humble and follow examples? Hmm. One of the last things that, that, that I'm gonna touch on briefly, I'm not gonna be here long, is next level communion. And it's funny in this, uh, in, in John's account, he doesn't go through the communion narrative that we're familiar with. All the other gospels have a uh, reference to that communion language that we know. And it's like, well, you know, he took the bread and he gave thanks and then he broke it. And then he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We know this, we know this. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We know these words. Most of us, we do it every month on the first Sunday and we honor the communion. And I was like, how do we take communion to the next level? How do we challenge ourselves to not just go through the motions and have empty rituals? I know none of us do it, but sometimes if you grow up church, you can repeat and, and, and recite what the pastor gonna say every single first Sunday for communion. You don't even think about it. We just do it. I can still re re recite my childhood pastor. On this night, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he gave that. Like you can recite these things, but we have to challenge ourselves not to just perform empty rituals. And so I had to go back and I had to think about this. How do we take our communion service to the next level? How do we be elevated enough to follow? What was happening here? I thought about it and it came to me and we, we often only focus on the Last Supper. This supper that we're remembering on tonight, we only think about the Last Supper. But if this is the Last Supper, there had to have been a First Supper. And what was happening there? What was the reason that all the Jews were gathered in Jerusalem on this week? to celebrate Passover. Why were they here? We tend to lose sight and, and, and a lot of times we, we, we wanna often look at the, the death of Christ. And it is important, it is important to the story for us to understand what happened there, his murder, state sanctioned murder that happened. And that's important to the story, but I like to challenge myself to think of the life of Jesus. And so he was there. He was still living at this time on this Thursday, on this Passover evening, celebrating the first Passover. And if y'all don't know by now, The Ten Commandments is my favorite movie. I watch it every single year. I can quote that thing backwards, forwards, upside down. That is my hands down favorite movie. And so it makes sense now why they show The Ten Commandments every year around Easter time. And I didn't catch it until this year. I elevated myself to catch it, that this year it is a reminder of why everyone was gathered on this Holy Thursday for Passover, to understand and, 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 and recall the account of the liberation out of bondage, out of Egypt, out of oppression. And so what came to me, this next level idea of communion is not only focusing on the Last Supper, but in your personal communion time, when you get that moment during the communion service to reflect, it's okay to celebrate your liberation from something. We have been through some things, family. 
especially as LGBTQIA folks, especially people on the fringes, especially all of the people that have been other. We have been liberated from something in our lives and it's okay to recognize that at communion time. We don't have to always just focus on death. It's okay. That's what Jesus was there for. They gathered around the table. They told the story of how they made it over and they honor those that help bring them out. We have our own prophet. We have our own liberator in the Archbishop Carl Bean. He gave us a new good news is how I like to call it. He gave us our what we believe statement. He showed us that you are just beautiful the way that you are. You are divine. Anytime that you look at yourself in the mirror, you are seeing the faith face of God. I look at each and what, every one of you. Everything that you are, everything that I am, God is. He taught us those things. He broke us free. He liberated us. We're no longer held down by oppression. Can't nobody come up to me and say, oh, you, you, you a trans man and you just ain't no real man. Can't nobody walk up to you if you are a gay male and be like, oh, you ain't no real man. You a sissy. They can't tell you that. All that I am, God is. God made me this way. I was born this way. I am divine. I am beautiful. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't tell me nothing. These are the things that we should incorporate into our communions, into the things that we recognize, into the things that we honor. Looking at the sacraments themselves, the bread, the wine, the bread, the wine, the bread is the body. The bread for me now symbolizes an opportunity to embody Christ in the world, to wrap myself in the Christ teachings, to wrap myself in the ways that, God, that Jesus walked on earth, to embody all of that. The wine representing the blood. We talk a lot about blood and, 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 and I, I go back to a time in like our youth. I know we don't do it so much now because you know, uh, all of the, uh, the, 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 the health concerns and all of that kind of stuff. But when we was kids, we had our good, good friends, our best friends, and they'd be like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my little sticky knife and I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna cut my little self here and you cut yourself, we're gonna bring it together and we now blood brothers, blood siblings. It's kind of the same sense. We take in the blood, the symbolic blood, and we are now siblings, blood siblings with Christ. It's a union. It is something that we can't separate. Once we have mingled ourselves with Christ, we can't separate that. Like I said, we can come in and out of our anointing as we move throughout the days and, 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 and situations, but we're never separated from the love of Jesus. We're never separated from the love of God. So I ask us, where's the beef? Where is the beef? Are we elevating ourselves enough to follow these examples? Are we committing ourselves to humble service to all people, everybody, it don't matter who it is, being of humble service to all people, are we taking with us the new commandment? Are we loving everybody the same way that Jesus loved us? And are we setting ourselves up for the new next level communion? Take that with you this week as we think about it. Look at the beef, write it down somewhere as your affirmation. I am being elevated, taking myself to the next level, I am being elevated enough to follow Jesus the Christ. Amen, amen, and amen.